Hey, sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to another edition of the Basketball Breakdown. Right now, we're doing it every Wednesday, but if you didn't uh, see my live show earlier uh, today with uh, using the um, Locker Room app, then uh, that happens every Wednesday and every Sunday. So I'm thinking that maybe I'll move this one to a different day, maybe a different time, so we're not exactly going up against the other NBA games. But it's preseason, so who cares right now what's going on with these games? And we'll, I'll get through our stuff, and, uh, and then we'll be able to get right back to the games or see what we want to watch for the late game. Now, here's the, th here's the thing I did that I thought would be even better, um, is I included the link in the description, and I'll, let me see, I'll, I'll put it in the... Um, comments right now where you can watch these two plays I put them up as a uh, as a video so you can see the two plays um, while we're doing this or um, maybe you know quickly go over there come back pause the live show whatever you want to do just so you can see what the plays are and how they were run fresh off the presses I got them from tonight's games I was watching them I figured you know what let's just see what we're going to find out from the first couple games tonight and then I'll grab something from there if it catches me luckily a couple plays did catch my eye and I was able to quickly Jot them down into Lucio Sports Assist app, and then uh, excuse me, in their whiteboard app, and then the Assist app is what's going to play it back. So I'm really excited about that because uh, it's going to be a really cool way of uh, di of showing you how we're going to diagram this stuff. So. Uh, every week I'm going to refine this and make it better and better. So I think this is a good idea. Check the comments right now. In fact, I should probably go and like pin that if I can. Let me see if I can do that. Jeez, Louise. Um, uh, let me switch over here to my other channel and hopefully it doesn't screw anything up. Uh, but it looks like we're live, right? We're all here. So um, if I go to my channel, I'm going to see if I can't pin that, uh, the show. But let's see, is it live? Let me see if I can find it real quick. Because, uh, yeah, let's see here. If I go, oh, actually, you know what I got to do? I probably have to go and get right to the thing because I want to make sure you guys see this play. Um, and let me mute this so we don't hear it. Okay. So let me pin this uh, on, uh, on in the comments. Let's see here. Can I do that? Here we go. So here's a comment. Watch the two clips here. And then uh, let me spell clips right. That would be a good idea. Sorry, just now we're just developing all this to make it work for, make it easier for you guys. So a little live, live uh, at YouTube for you. And let me pin that. So, all right, you guys all see the link. You can watch the two plays right now, whatever would probably help. And then I'm going to go into it. So are you ready? Because the first one is an age-old play that we've seen run. A lot of times we see it run just in the flow of a game. But uh, I caught it as an out-of-bounds play, which, again, I always like a good out-of-bounds play that's designed to get a shot. And uh, if you can run your offense out of an out-of-bounds play, even better. Why teach two separate kind of offenses? So uh, the first one we call is Zipper. And so when we cut to let – me, let me bring this up on so we can see this. So here is Zipper, and you can see, uh, first of all, I'm using a thing called, um, uh, thank you, uh, Lucio Sports uh, Assist. And a lot of NBA teams use this on their, in their huddles right now on an iPad. Uh, and it's a really powerful play, uh, you know, playbook design thing with animated, you know, numbers. I can change the numbers into letters if I want. So if you have a team who wants to use this, you can easily make it easier for them to follow based on the letters instead of numbers. Uh, you get everything all prepped and ready to go. So boom, on the left side hand, you, the left hand side, you're going to be able to grab whatever play you want. And then I'm just going to hit a play because if you did see this tonight, uh, this was what the Bulls ran uh, originally. Or, sorry, the Bulls ran this out of the out-of-bounds play and it ultimately got a, uh, a three ball in the corner for Zach Levine. So let's just look at this real quick. I'm going to let it play. I'm going to go into turtle mode so that it's slow. And uh, here, let's watch it. Boom. Okay. So this is called Zipper. And why? Because the original first cut from the one off of the pin down on the four on the strong side is what we call a zipper cut. I can remember this. Let's go back in time a little bit. I can remember running this or learning this at Wisconsin when I was a basketball manager uh, and Stu Jackson was the head coach. Um, he would do, uh, I, I, you know, it's weird because when you think about your life and your, um, and your uh, experiences and you, what you can remember, what you can't remember, I mean, I was at practices every day for two straight years. Why do I remember certain things from certain practices? I have no idea. But this one I remember distinctly him putting it in. And um, this one, oh, and you know what? Let me take off the locker room thing. I'm realizing that shouldn't be on there. Uh, here we go. Forgive me. Uh, let's do that. So 
Um, what he would do is the, the symbol was, you know, zipper, like you're zipping up a jacket. And uh, he taught this. He taught the, the point guard comes up from the block uh, off of a, of a big man's screen. So you have the one coming off the four. And let's actually diagram this. So we have, uh, if we go to the, um, uh-oh, why is this not? Okay, so let me get my thing here. Okay, so the one is going to come up off the four, and that is the zipper cut. Stay tuned. I'm getting my new iPad and my new pen, so I'll be able to write this a lot better than without my finger, okay? So be, be prepared for that sooner, uh, although I think Apple's got a little backup, so I might have to wait another 10 days. Okay, so that's a zipper cut right there, and then and the four is setting that screen. Now, you can do a lot of things off of this. If you set that screen um, and the one comes up off that, off this guy setting the screen here, the, well, then the four can then just, you know, dive into the post. And, you know, the three might even be able to throw it down into the post right there. That's not a bad play either. Uh, in fact, uh, I always prefer, if I can, to throw uh, the ball from the sideline to the post. It's a devastating area to get right away towards. And conversely, on the defensive end, uh, I do not let my defense, let the, the offense throw the ball to the low post on the, from the out-of-bounds play. So we go back to um, this play. So let's clean this off. And uh, let's continue going to what we have. So let's watch that again. So there's the first cut, and then boom. And then that should get you open from the three to the one because you're going away from the basket. So hopefully you all had a chance to check out the link in the description or link in the pinned comment. And you can watch this play right away and then you know come back to me or whatever you want to do. Uh, so you can see you, know, you can have it in your head too. But the real crux of the matter out of the zipper here is what's going on on the weak side here because this is where you get a lot of really great action. This is, and this is such an old play, but when you get good spacing and you hope the whole basket area is open, it helps. The five sets a screen away, and the two has a whole lot of things he can do. He could curl. He could come and cut back door on this one. You can do a lot of different stuff out of this. And, in fact, what we've seen a lot of, um, a lot of the time is – if the two like curls and is not open and can, it can keeps going getting out of there, the five can turn around and then come right back up to pinch post. If you might remember, we worked on pinch post and talked about it last week. And now if the one throws it to five, he can come running around and look for the pass back. You got a two man game on that open left side. Uh, you got a lot of things that can happen. Excuse me. <clears throat> so. Um, I'll keep adding things and I'll keep showing you stuff that, that grips me. But again, I'll show you that on, on, a bl on a blank board so it's a little more clear. But if the five comes and sets that screen away and the two comes off of here and curls and it's not open, okay, then the five can just turn right back around and cut to the high post, to the pinch post area. The one has the ball and he passes it here and then he just follows his pass looking for the handoff back. If I can fake it, he can turn in the lane, he can do all face up and you got things going on the weak side. So that is what's happening there. So let's pick this up from where we left off. So now I kind of had it where he catches the ball and then curls, but you know, the two is basically curling all the way through for the, on the catch into the lane. So if you notice what happened here, uh, it's pretty simple on the weak side. You can do two different things. If after the four um, screens down, what the Bulls did was he opens up to the corner. Now, it looks to me like Zach Levine inbounding wanted to go to the corner, but uh, the guy sitting the screen kind of bumped him up out of there, and he stayed up here at the wing, uh, Zach Levine did, going to the wing. But you could switch this. You could have Zach Levine enter and go to the corner, and the four could kind of flare out here. The four could set a screen for Zach Levine after he screens and then assume the spot on the wing. So you can do a lot of things with that. But what they ended up doing was just having the, uh, the guy setting the pin down four going to the corner, loosening up. So as soon as the two comes around and catches that ball on the curl, he's going to attack right in the middle. And this is great because now the five, you know, let's say you had a shooter at the five. This is great. He could span out to the three-point line. You've got shooters here and here. And then the one is just kind of hover in this area too. He can't get too close to the three. But um, well, I'll show you another play in the next play that kind of has the same feeling on this one where the one can kind of – things can happen out of that. But meanwhile, we get a pass to the corner, and I believe it's just uh, the uh, shot. Uh, oh, you know what happens? I believe at this end of this thing, uh, four is now facing a closeout. So whoever – I think it was probably X4 is guarding him. It's like sprinting out there like a crazy man, and everyone else is rotating, you know, all the defenders. And so he quickly gives a quick pass to, to the three, which is Zach Levine, who hits the jumper right there. A great way to get the defense scrambling because let's not forget, when we're talking about what the purpose of offense is – it's to force closeouts, 
and to penetrate in the middle and get open shots, right? So you want to force close out and then attack it. Um, no more of the triple threat stuff where you catch and you rip through and you wait and then the te- you give the defense a chance to catch up. So these are all actions like what can you do in the very beginning of the possession to get that, that penetration, to get the defense out of position where now they have to scramble and help and then rotate out. And that's where things like skip passes come in. That's where things like curling into the lane for passes on the run come in. So we want to try and eliminate some of those stagnant catches where you're just sort of standing there on the, on the wing or you had to do a V cut back away from the basket. That's the troubling thing with a lot of different sets you might see in, on offense is that they'll have cuts where the guy end up, is ending up sprinting away from the basket to make the catch. He's got a catch. He's got to turn all the way around, all his momentum. He can't sort of catch and attack as easily. So you want to be able to figure out ways where you have the correct angles where you're going into the lane. Um, so I hope that that, was, that makes sense. Let me see where everyone is, and let's check out some of the comments here because, oh, great, we got a lot of, a lot of people here. Um, so anyway, Jarvis, thank you so much for being in there, watching all the videos. What's up, Heat Peaked? Uh, the Hawks winning a, a ring this year, Nick Alexander. Those are bold words, but I like what the Hawks are doing. Oh, my goodness. If you remember, if you want a question and get it to the top, Super Chat's the way to go. And uh, forgive me, Alan Jams, we, uh, you threw it in there. I, you, I you got it right by me like a good pass. Uh, I love this. I need to know everything in basketball. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Um, really, really appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, uh, eight, uh, 800,000 subscribers. Amazing. Thank you guys so much for being part of this. I, you know, I, I don't do this, but if you, they're all, the, all the old videos are still up. Don't watch them because they're terrible to think about where I came from 10 year, over 10 years ago. Um, but it's just been a, um, just a wonderful ride all the way across. And I can't wait to do it for another 10 years at least. Um, so, uh, the Warriors are looking good. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm doing a video probably for tomorrow. Is, is Steph an MVP? Can he become an MVP again? Uh, he's, the way they're playing him is a nice mix between playing it like Clay and like himself. And that's just dangerous. And that ball is dizzying how fast it moves on the Warriors now. I mean, they're going to probably break the record for a speed of ball moving and, and player movement. Um, really amazing. Um, let's see here. Van Hoot, my, my pleasure. Oh, my God. Jiggle Puff doing two days with me. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go. Uh, Jiggle Puff, I owe you, man. Uh, I'm waiting for a Manscaped ad right now. Damn, you know, I should think about doing some of that stuff. But I like to keep these a little bit, you know, uh, you know free of the, uh, the ads, if you will, just so we get the concentrated footage. Um, Cordy Court, thank you so much. I'm going to quickly go through and see if I can find any good questions or not, because i got another play for you guys. But don't forget, in, that, in the comment below, uh, in the pinned comment and then the description, I have a link to watch this, the clips so you'll know what's ca- coming and I can explain it. Uh, although I am thinking, you know what, as far as zipper goes, maybe we should go over a couple other possibilities here. I know I kind of showed you um, the, um, you know, like a pinch post action out of that, but let's clear this off. And uh, and talk about it. Let's go get a, let's get a clear uh, bucket. You know what? Maybe I should do is make this bigger, so it's like you let you don't need to see all the other stuff. What if I did this? Let's try this. This is live live TV, folks. Oh boy, let me try this. All right, move that there. That's that's probably better. You know what? Let me. I'm going to do this real quick because I feel like let's scale this up a little bit more and then move that guy. All right, you ready for this? Bam! All right, let's scale this up. So now you got a bigger court to see. Maybe easier to see on your phone if that's what you're on. Okay, so remember, uh, we have what? Uh, the zipper cut. So three, inba- three is inbounding. We have um, one, you know, your, your, ball, your basic ball handler catching the ball because obviously you want him to get the ball to control the offense. Boom, zipper cut off of the four. Again, it doesn't really matter who is here. Now the five starts at the other elbow. And again, you, you can do a lot of fun things out of this. You can actually curl this one around these guys. And, you know, Brad Stevens would probably throw this pass all the way across the top. Maybe what he would do is um, you'd see one, and then we would call this, and you'll see this in the next clip called Iverson cut. Basically, when you cut across two big men who are, like, setting screens across here, this is an Iverson cut across the, the top, and usually the ball is somewhere up here. But you could still run it where the ball is here on the out-of-bounds, and the one does that. And then if the two is here, he'll just kind of move in opposition of the one across the court out of the way. And then three could throw this ball all the way there. And then what you got is five diving, four cutting up. Uh, you got a lot of actions you can get out of this, especially because, again, remember what the point of the offense is, to make the, uh, the defense scramble. And I can guarantee you, if this one comes around these screens for that kind of a pass, 
you're going to probably have guys scrambling to kind of get back in position off of that if he catches it. And now you got all the world is your oyster. Split your split your feet on the catch, attack the middle, and now the defense will never catch up as long as you don't let them catch up. So a lot of things you can do out of this. But again, uh, let's see. Let me see if I can give you one more option. And maybe you know if you guys want to shout out one in the comments, I'm going to keep the comments up in front of me so I can see them. Uh, you know, shout out a comment or a a, a, um, a wrinkle out of this, and I'll diagram it. Can you explain how to beat a two three z defense? Okay, um, I you know if you watch my videos on um, the Lakers going against the zone, and then somebody maybe it was the Celtics going against the Heat zone as well. I did a lot of breakdown explaining where it is, and the one thing that pops into my head right now, right away, if we're talking about a zone, you know, if you got your two three, basically is like this, you know, is this is the lane I think you got to attack right into here. So you got to be looking to drive, but you're not looking to score. You're looking to suck the two uh, defenders, this defender and this defender, in together. You got a shooter in the corner. You can kick out to real quick. You get a shot, or you can then drive. You get baseline there. You got. You should get a lot of good shots. So these are the. This is the lane right in here where you're always looking to try and attack into a freeze dribble, which is you're not looking to score and penetrate because you're going to go into like at least two players, maybe three. You want to suck them in so you can kick it out. So that's a really great, just a basic idea of how to attack uh, conceptually. And then from there, you want to make sure you want to see if you can make it where, um, you know, you can teach guys how to skip pass without throwing it away. Because, again, the skip pass kills defenses as well. So there you go for that. Great question. Even Phil used zipper fist and zipper iso as a pressure release in the triangle on occasion. Okay. Zipper fist. Great, great point. Let's talk about zipper, zipper fist, shall we? So fist, generally, when you hear about that uh, on a court, is a pick and roll, okay, generally. So what you'll see, uh, Phil would run this. Uh, I mean, I think Pop runs this more than anybody, is uh, you'll see the one cut up off of here, the three will throw the ball in, and then the five will, as soon as he catches it, it's coming up here and screen, screen and roll that way. So as soon as you get the guy, the one catches the ball, don't give him a chance. Don't give the defender a chance. Boom, you're, you're getting into a pick and roll out top, spread floor. Uh, great way to run that too. So um, that's another good point. Great point, tail dog. Um, so let's see here. Yeah, it's a little overloaded, Nate, because it's a sideline out of bounds. Uh, but then it quickly becomes unloaded. So, hey, share this with everybody. Let's get everybody in here. Let's make this a big party, shall we? Uh, let's see here. Thank you for uh, the, the Dragon Balls. I, I do uh, pride myself. I think I have a really cool one I'm going to do on ad transitions coming up. So stay tuned for a new sponsor. Uh, it's a new cereal, which is really good. So stay tuned for that. Uh, you can turn that into an elevator cut. Oh, yes. Okay, so that's a great example. Who said that? Uh, Bibby Boy. Check this out. So anytime you see a two big men here on the, on the elbows, you can always think uh, elevator. And what is elevator, if you don't know? Basically, the one is here, right? And the three is here. And, they, and you see a lot of teams run this. Uh, again, I, I have a little trouble when you're running a, a, a cutter so far, so quickly away from the basket to a catch because he's got to turn around after he catches it. It's not so easy. But the elevator does work. And that is basically instead of going up on the zipper cut on the outside of the four like we diagrammed, he can come right through the middle and the four and the five are going to shut the elevator doors here together. They're going to put their shoulders together and, uh, and close the door so one can't get in. The, only, the reason why it works better is if the guy guarding X1 needs to be a couple steps behind him. And that usually means uh, there's a, some sort of screen set. So this is how you get him to be behind the action here. Let me erase this so we don't get confused yet. So I would almost do something like this where, um, where like maybe one sets a screen for two. Now, at that point, if one does that, maybe one's man will get a little bit caught up with number with two as well, and so he'll be behind the play. So then two, one shoots right through those doors. The four and the five close the doors there, and uh, and then you know you get a shot there or something. You know. Now, uh, my favorite action out of this is uh, two gets out of there in the corner. So once four sets this screen, and they usually they, 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 they like to switch this right. So four's man will kind of pop up to get the one. Well, then four cuts right to the hoop. Three can pass it to him. Uh, another great way to get a back door. So great, great point on that one, uh, Bibby Boy. Love it. Uh, hey, Coach, what are your thoughts on Bruno Fernando? I have high hopes for him. He is athletic, plays hard. I haven't really seen him, so I'll have to get my eyes on him before I can tell you. Um, let's see here. Can you explain a play where, like this, a way to have a two-way death trap where you can get an easy three-point opportunity and also another roll using picks? Um, well, I think I, I'm sort of showing that right here, Dragon Ball. I hope that made sense. But uh, I tell you what, 
We're already 22 minutes into the show. Let's go on to the next clip. Don't forget, in the description, I have a link to, so you can actually see these clips right from, ripped from today's headlines, from the games today. So let me put, call that up because we have the next play, which is called, uh, this is from the Bulls ran this, uh, and Iverson. Now, again, this is a little bit confusing. I'm working with Lucio. Maybe we can kind of do a thing where there's less um, arrows to, to begin with. Um, but I'm going to play it for you and we can go through it. And by the time we're done, it's going to be really crystal clear for you. So this is a cool one. And we already talked about Iverson cuts, so you're going to recognize that. So we got, the, we got the turtle setting, so it'll be a little bit slow. And uh, let's see how, how it unfolds. There's the Iverson cut, three across the top. Now the four follows, and for a ball screen, boom, boom, love it. Okay? Now we didn't quite get this exactly. The five did not pass the four, even though he should have, and they ended up getting a, a good cut, and I'll show you what that what happened there um, at the end, although now my mind is blanking. But I, I can remember almost the whole thing, and you guys can correct me if you've seen the actual play. So let's watch this again a little bit in piecemeal. Um, so we have the... The first thing's first. So here's the thing. A lot of times, like in the high school level, that pass of one isn't so easy just for him to cut out and get it. In the NBA, they're a little bit more nonchalant. They kind of let you get the ball in there from that far from the hoop. So let's just pretend in the high school level, too, they'll let you make that pass if you're that far. Because, you know, look, he's way above the hash mark. So the ball comes in, and then what they do is we're going to take three on the weak side and get a double stagger across the court, which is an Iverson cut, named after Allen Iverson, because he would run this play all the time where they would run him across the court with an open um, uh, uh, baseline for him to just catch it, rip, and go. Um, but what we do here is, so there, you can see the three coming across and getting the double screen by the four and the five. Now, after that, the four is going to trail, and the timing is crucial here to get there, you know, uh, about a step after he catches the ball. You don't want to be right on top of him, but you want to get there so that uh, three catches the ball, pivots to face the basket, and then bam, there's the screen back. At that time, it's an important thing is the five needs to move out of there so that there's more of a lane uh, to attack. It's an inside ball screen. So three needs to have room to be able to turn that corner. That's why five gets out sort of to the nail or to the weak side elbow. And then one kind of clears out. Now, what's cool about this is he turns the corner in the, in the game, and they had, they had clogged this up pretty well, uh, and there wasn't a lot, a lot of room to get attack there. So his release valve is to the five. Now, the reason why there wasn't a lot of room is because the five's man was in the way. So you kind of want the five. So if, let's just say X5 was, is guarding him, right? He came over a little bit to show. So that means three can make that pass right to five because five is open. Meanwhile, we remember four had already been setting a, a ball screen and rolling, and that is the pass that was open. It would be a beautiful boom, boom, quick play for a layup. Didn't quite happen that way, unfortunately, but I, that's why I diagrammed it. So what, uh, what happened was, let me clear this, was, let me see here, I think I got far enough, is that once five got the ball here, one was moving behind him, and this is a little bit of a blind pig like we see in the triangle, and we showed this last week too, was, he can cut in behind him because what does X1 do when the ball gets to the five here? He turns his head and looks here at the ball, right? And that's when one can take advantage and cut back door. And I believe what happened was, I think he hands it off, right? It got a little bit tight because two was over here. I think two was in the corner. So I think he, get a, he did a quick pass to here to uh, Levine, and Levine just nailed the three. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that right? I believe that's what happened. Um, I quickly, you know, I don't have a lot of time because I grabbed this like, you know, 20 minutes before it went live and I had to quickly do it all. But tell me in the comments, am I right? Um, let's see here. Uh, and let's go through some of the comments before we get throwing. So thank you, Drado. It's been amazing. 800,000. I can't believe it. Um, which team uses this action a lot? Uh, you know, I think I see a lot of teams run it. Boy, I gotta like gotta search in my mind's eye right now. For some reason, I'm kind of like picturing it like um, what's his face, uh, Jamal Murray in Denver, kind of getting this a little bit. But um, you know, you can you really can run it for any dynamic guard. Like James Harden would love this if they could get him to run an offense like this. He'd be great at it. Um, so Josh, I guess you just missed it. I talked about two three zone defense, but maybe I'll go through it again a little bit more in more detail uh, in a minute. So let's go through the whole thing here and watch it one more time so we can get a handle on what's happening here because this really is a nice play. A lot of, a lot of stuff going on, though. So you, it's a lot of timing, a lot of spacing stuff. So again, uh, ball comes in. Two clears out all the way to the weak side while three. So you can see two and three are kind of moving like orbiting each other around the, around the lane. Uh, three comes off that double screen. Now look, if the ball comes here, he can reject that screen 
Okay, and when I say reject, I mean don't use it. So here comes four setting a ball screen. He could take a step here and then, you know, just drive. Look at, there's nobody here, right? And if there is, if X5 comes over to help like he should, then five just moves along with him and he gets a layup. Or five gets the ball here and then boom, he gets to the two and then it's a, it's a three-pointer. You know what I mean? So you can get all these kind of plays like that out of this. And that's what the beauty of this play is you got, when you get a, a snapback action. And what I mean by snapback, what I kind of like it is you have um, – you have the, let's see, what is it, the three? What did I say? Anyway, the three comes all the way here, catches it, and then snaps back in off of the, off the ball screen at the, uh, near the elbow. I love that kind of, all those kind of actions. It's like you lead the defense one direction, and then bam, you're right back into another action. Another reason why I like handoffs, because um, dribble handoffs are the same idea. You're dribbling, dribbling in one direction, and then bam, as soon as you hand off, it breaks back the other way. It's hard for the defense to catch up, and that's a play that they've been running since the beginning of basketball. That's how smart they were when they developed it. So, um, and then throw out some other ideas. If you see some options out of here, I'll diagram them for you because I feel like uh, there could be some really cool stuff here. Um, and then as we go back, let's just watch the finish it up. Okay, so there's the inside ball screen here for three. Uh, and by the way, again, p positionless basketball. Anybody can play any of these positions. Uh, there, he, you know, it's almost designed to suck the defense in to give it to five. Almost like three isn't going to score. Now, don't forget, though, that when you set an inside ball screen... When you set a ball, a ball screen, you know, usually it's on the wing uh, here, this way, and the ball comes this way, and there's n this whole area is open, there's nobody here, there's no help, you should get a layup, pretty much. It's devastating, because once you get into the lane here on, off the dribble, and then the four is rolling, there's nobody to help out in the four. You should be able to get the pass to the four for the layup, and guess what? If he's not open, it's because you're open driving to the basket. And if you get cut off two and you can't give it to four, well, that, that's, that just means that two, or your shooter in the corner, is wide open for the pass here. So that's why setting an inside ball screen is so devastating. And like, I feel like we kind of didn't have that for a long time. Um, I know the Bulls ran in the triangle and their high post ac action they would run, they would throw that run that inside uh, you know, ball, uh, ball screen. I got to go look at the Jazz and like the Stockton Malone stuff. They probably did it too, but we're seeing so much more of it now because I think they kind of just finally realized crap, this is a great action. And if you do it with an empty corner, it's a layup and you can't stop it. So there you go. So let me see here. We have any good comments? Uh, how many plays do coaches actually get to dictate in the game? Great question. Especially now what's going on with these games. I've been watching them now. Again, it's preseason, so they're probably still trying to you know, get everything installed or whatever. But um, right now, it's all free flow as the game's going on. Every time there's a timeout or a break for an out-of-bounds, even if it's a quick out-of-bounds, they're going to call a play generally. And that's the only chance they get. Now, they might be 15 times a game. 16, okay? There's probably, what, 90, 100 possessions in a game. So I would say a coach has control with a call of a play in the half court probably, you know, less than 20% of the time. That's how crazy it is now. And that's not bad because the, the more free form it is, the harder it is to defend. In theory, as long as you train your players to recognize good shots and know how to balance the floor well. And that's where you start seeing stuff like, because everyone can handle the ball and everyone can really have skills now in every team. But it's the decisions they make and when they attack and where they attack and whether they can actually see the right play, the right opening or not for the pass or the shot. Those decisions are what separate the good teams from the bad teams. You know, and eventually that comes to the coaching. Are, are the coaches able to educate the players enough and the players are willing to listen enough uh, to follow what they want them to do? Uh, it's, a, it's a real good balancing act. But that's a good question. And so, yeah, I would say it's less than 20%. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, do you think that the Spurs don't run plays like they should right now because the Spurs ball movement died ever since? And that's not true. I saw the bull, uh, the, the Spurs running some really good stuff. Uh, it was a lot of sort of typical 21 series like we've seen with Dan Tony, handoff into ball screen, you know, stuff like that. They did a couple, uh, you know, double ball screens across the top. So I'm seeing some nice varied offense and a lot of ball movement, which is what you're always going to see with the uh, Spurs. So I don't see the ISO stagnancy like we had seen in the past. At least right now, it's still early. Uh, and they've got the three new guys, well, the three new guys, the three younger guys, whatever you want to call them. Uh, although um, Derek White isn't out there yet. I didn't see him, but uh, you got Lonnie Walker and uh, DeJounte Murray and, um, oh my goodness, the third guy who I'm forgetting right now. Uh, but they all look better, and they all look uh, a lot more, you know, in sync. So, so they, they can't defend anybody. By the way, that's a big problem. But um, they'll be they'll be interesting to watch on offense. Uh, let's see, Nick Alexander. Who do you think will be more productive this season, Al Horford or Marcus All? They're playing styles are very similar. I don't think that they're very similar. 
I mean, I don't think Horford can pass nearly as well as Gasol and do that. Horford certainly looks a lot more aggressively to score than Gasol does. Um, but Gasol's up to his old self on the high post, and they're letting him do that. So uh, I think it's going to be fun to watch. The question for Gasol is how many minutes he's going to play. Um, and I don't know if he's going to get a lot of minutes compared to Horford, who probably would get more. Um, but I, I really like Gasol, you know, pound for pound, minute for minute. Uh, he'll, he'll probably be better, I think. Um, when I see, let's see, BB Boy, when I see teams run sets similar to this, the five to the rolling four lob is open a ton. Yes. Uh, it's basically, I think, what I designed, right? Maybe as earlier before. The five cutting the four lob or a bounce pass, or whatever you want to do, uh, works really well. A high low action. How many plays do we call? Okay, here we go. But you don't, don't you think the three could get screened? All right, let's go back to the beginning here and figure out what we're talking about. All right, let's go back. So, who, don't you think the three can get screened? Let me see here. What's the question? There, there could be many uh, areas where the ball handler could get screened. Um, yes. Well, yeah, you can totally screen um, across different different areas. So, yes, good point. Um, can you explain the effectiveness of, effectiveness of handoffs in, a, in small lineups and also how effective it is switching in the modern NBA? Um, Okay. Well, I mean, obviously, the effectiveness of handoffs, no matter what you're doing, is is the key. Is that it's like a it's like a, a full speed pick and roll, you know, where you're doing it running, which is why it does work so well. Um, now, the best way to defend the, that these days is switching, um, and so that's why that ends up being that's that blows up a lot of that action because you can quickly pick up the guy getting the handoff. Uh, and then there are fun ways to combat that. You can cut door before the hand, cut back door before the handoff. The guy can fake the handoff and go. Um, so there's a lot, it's a good cat and mouse game to play. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have a small lineups without like really big guys who can like set big, you know, lumbering screens, then sure, the, uh, a dribble handoff is a lot better of a way because now it's just faster paced, um, and that that'll give you an advantage if you're small. Uh, let's see here. Hey, Liam. Uh, let's see, who will be a breakout star this year? Oh, my goodness gracious. I, these are the questions. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, gosh, Lonnie Walker caught my eye. I, I wonder if he'll get – he should get plenty of opportunities to do really well. Um, but he won't really be on a great team, so that might go under the radar. Um, I don't know. Somebody else give me an idea who we're thinking because I can't picture right now who's a breakout star besides everyone who already is. Um, I don't know. Uh, in a team like, like the Lakers, do you think LeBron controls most of the plays? Yeah. For sure. Um, can you explain how the point guard runs plays during the game or when coaches call plays on the sidelines and how the defense doesn't react? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically it depends on the, you know, how, who the point guard and the coach. So at some point you might remember when Rondo went to Dallas uh, and it did not go well because Rick Carlisle back then wanted to call every single play. So there's an example, by the way, when I said it's, it's you know, less than 20%. Well, not from the Mavericks. He would literally call every play down and they'd be looking back every time. It drove me nuts. Uh, I don't think that's it's a, by accident that the year well, Luca comes in, but he says, "Okay, I'm not, you guys can just go, and well, I'll just call the out of timeout plays." Uh, there's no, there's, it's not by uh, coincidence that they end up having the greatest offensive rating of all time. Um, but we saw that, and so obviously Rondo comes in, and he's used to calling the plays himself. He sees the floor, he reads the game. He's got a crazy IQ in basketball, and uh, they couldn't handle it. Either Rondo couldn't handle it, or uh, Carlisle couldn't handle it, and it became a real problem. They got him out of there really fast. So that's the that's the trust you got to have. It was a midseason trade, so it probably would have gone a lot better had he been there in the beginning in the training camp and they got on the same mind meld. But I suspect that Carlisle felt like, you know what, I don't have time. You just got to listen to what I'm telling you. And and Rondo was like, but that's not like the best call. Uh, so anyway, most of the time though, you'd hope it would go a lot smoother than that. Um, and and by the way, I, I would if I were if I was coaching in the NBA, I'd say you know I'd give him a lot of leeway as long as it was working, you know. And I'd say please, you guys control the game and see how it works. Now and again, out of timeout plays and those things, maybe I got some ideas. I'd, I'd call those. But that, there, there's no greater joy for a coach than to see your team execute on its own with its own mind. That that to me is the the epitome of coaching, the ultimate. Um, Spurs lack the depth to make a championship run. Well, okay, they don't they don't have the defense. Uh, do you think the coaches should? Uh, should call plays on defense and crunch time a lot more. 
Now that's interesting. So when you talk about calling plays on defense, to me it's almost like you know switch from zone to man or trap. Uh, and yeah, I mean that's that's the one area you can do things kind of on the fly a lot easier in my mind than um, than the offense is the defensive stuff. You can make adjustments pretty quickly, and we'll see that. Like they'll hear the call, and then you'll see the point guard guarding the ball in the backcourt make a fist or make some sort of symbol, and they can kind of break into what they want to do pretty quickly a lot easier oftentimes than it is for the offense to do that. So yeah, that that's coach. That also is coaching. The defensive stuff is really fun. That's why Nick Nurse is fun to watch because he's always trying to you know make that happen, and that's that's what really is cool uh, when you can see them adjust. Now remember, the thing about running a zone is you know, maybe you don't get a stop every time, but when you flip back to man, you might get the turnover there, and then it becomes kind of worth it because you set them up for that for a couple possessions, and then bam, you go right back to man, and they don't they were ready for a zone, and they throw the ball away. Um, and so you credit the man to man for doing that, but really it was because you were at the zone. Um, what is the most popular action coaches use for a buzzer beater play? Oh my goodness gracious. That's a great, great question. Um, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of random what people do these days. Uh, you know, obviously if you can remember the, it's the Brad Stevens thing or, and then they use it for, um, Nick Nurse kind of did it some version of it. We talked about it in one of these, maybe the first episode, uh, the OG shot, was, you know, it was something like, remind me, but I feel like OG was like here, the ball was coming inbound to here, and he just kind of came like this way here. They threw it all the way across the court, and he caught it and shot it. Uh, Brad Stevens likes to do that. He actually likes to do something even weirder where he'll, he'll have like the big man, I want to say like start here, and then he'll go to the, to, the, to the low block here, and they'll throw the ball, you know, way here to the big man there. It's a strange kind of thing. And then I feel like out of that, you, there's something happening where like, you know, three, uh, let's see, no, let me change that, the four, um, you know, like four sets a screen here, and let's just say the two comes off of that, and then the five who caught the ball here can kick it out in like one motion, like a kind of a, not a Hail Mary, a uh, Statue of Liberty kind of thing. So that's a, that's a good way to do it, but you got to really trust the inbounder that he's going to make that pass. It's a long pass. That's a 30, 40 foot pass with a, some height on it. Um, not always easy to do. But uh, that's that's one that comes to mind. I don't know. I mean, it's so, so hard. For me, it's like if you want to get a guy open who's a shooter, then have him set a screen, preferably for a cutter going to the hoop. And we saw that in the WTF play, right? And you can do that for the uh, for the um, you know for the uh, last second. So the ball is getting inbounded here. And let, you know, let's say you have your shooter, you know, here. Have him set like a back screen here for like you know your athletic big. Whatever you hope that the two guys kind of go to that because they're worried for let's just say you're down two and they get it's a tying shot, but then it's two comes off of that, bam, and you get the pass. Now you can also have a, another guy setting a screen here on that one. It gets a little bit crowded here, and maybe the five switches out. You don't have a lot of time, so a lot of times it might be better to get to clear the space out so two has more of a rain in that area to kind of get himself open somehow. But remember, I don't like. When, you, when you're sprinting from the basket to get the, bat, the shot there, it's very hard to make that. So we've seen like Damian Lillard you know, win series where he's coming laterally to the ball. So when he catches it, it's a less of a turn to get that shot. So that's really what you want to be looking for in those angles. You don't really want it to be like directly away from the basket for a catch. It's too hard to like catch and get your momentum going, which applies to any time of the game. But certainly if you only have like a second or two to get the ball, get the shot off. Um, let's see here. But the Spurs have a superstar that could take the Spurs to the championship. No. Another positive of, d- d- of dribble handoffs is it kind of distracts the off-ball defenders and sets up the ball, the off-ball actions to be more successful. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I would go with that. The dribble handoff, you're like, oh, what's he doing? You turn your head. I mean, any kind of dribbling, you know, usually gets the other, the weak side defender's attention. So for sure. Um, what's the most unique, unbelievable play you've seen so far? Oh, my goodness gracious. I mean, the ones I'm grabbing for these are the ones I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll diagram one. And I, because I, I had seen this and I sent it to some, to, to some people. So we all know, you know what? I should probably do this for next week, but nonetheless, I'll show it to you here. Maybe I'll get, I'll actually animate it for you next time. But we all know what a floppy set is, a single double. If you don't, it's like imagine five and a four and a, let's say a three. The two and the one up top of the ball. So uh, this is a single double. Single screen here, double screen here. Two can decide which direction he wants to go and, and get the ball, right? And usually, hopefully, for a shot coming around here, but ball goes here, he's open for the shot, right? Single double, floppy, whatever you want to call it. Well, I saw this setup 
where they had the five and the four. Let's, well, actually, it's probably like five and the four, and like maybe the three was here, two was here, and the one was here. And instead of what looked like to be a floppy, and everyone was going to focus on the two cutting, all of a sudden, before the two starts to move, the five and the four both. Oh, 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 I guess you can't put uh, you can't put both fingers on there at the same time. Uh, my bad. All right, so the five and the four at the same time both came up and set a, a phalanx screen on the for the one. And the one, the play, I, I'm forgetting who ran it. I'll think about it maybe in a second. He comes off the screen wide open and just nails the three. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't the Warriors. It was Washington, maybe. It might have been Washington. Uh, anyway, so I, that was a really clever play that really caught my eye. Like that is viable for a lot of teams who have a good point guard that can shoot off the dribble. So um, you know, and then meanwhile. I think the two kind of held his position and then was waiting to see where uh, the one went. When he went to this side, he would go that way on, you know, off of this. The three stays there. And you can get a lot of things off of this once you get that, that double ball screen. So uh, that's not a bad example. Man, I pulled that out of somewhere in my head. I don't know. But that was uh, that's a good example of something that caught my eye already in this preseason. DHO, dribble handoff. That's what that means. How do you think the Nets should run their offense? You know, it's going to be a real, really uh, interesting, um, you know, nice dilemma uh, to figure out how to get Kyrie and KD to not just ISO take turns like we've seen, you know, Kyrie and LeBron do and KD and uh, Russ do. Now, KD, we've seen a lot in the very beginning when he gets to these teams, you know, be very amenable to moving without the ball and, and getting all everything moving. And then as the season wears on and he, he, you know, he's like, screw this. We got to get a score. I got to take over. Whatever it works, he does it again. I, I can't blame the guy. But um, I think obviously they'll be best at when they, they can involve them both in the same kind of action. So what I would say is, first of all, I love to see KD at the high post a little bit. And then, you know, if KD gets the ball here and then now Kyrie could do um, – you know, you know, uh, high post splits with, uh, you know, wh whoever else is in the corner, you know, uh, that guy curls and then Kyrie can come back around for the handoff with, with KD. Great two man game. Obviously, you want to see a lot of pick and rolls with uh, KD screening for Kyrie. And then, by the way, I really want to see the other way where Kyrie ball screens for KD. So they better do that 10 times a game. You know, so they probably should have KD screen for Kyrie five, you know, six times, and then have Kyrie screen for KD four times. I, I might be a little bit off. It might be maybe a little bit less, maybe eight times in a game. But they better get that as a consistent thing when they, and so that they're ready for it in the playoffs and they can run it. Um, and you know, a lot of times you'll see teams want to have like play them in opposition. So if Kyrie has the ball here, you want KD on the weak side and have that balance just to, for maximum like separation of the defense. And that's okay too. But I think uh, I would want to see more opportunities to have them in, involved in actions where they're screening for each other, where they're uh, off ball too. Um, and then KD on the high post, I think, would be real viable for them. Uh, let's see here. Who's better, Alex Caruso or LeBron? Eh, LeBron. Off ball screen or some sort of floppy. There you go. I believe I believe it's a double screen, and then they catch and shoot or pass it off the guy. They don't pay attention to this. Why shooters are so dangerous? Okay. Um, let's see. Abinov says in teams where there is a single superstar during crunch time, is it better to let him have the ball even though he is heavily guarded, or let the other players handle? I mean, that's an aged old question. LeBron has proven that he's willing to make the pass after he has the ball up top if it's the right play, and you can't fault him for that. So um, yeah, uh, I would say. Uh, you, you want the, you want your best player to have the ball, you know, at least in the beginning and, and begin the process. But then you want to have your other guys trained so they're ready and they can win the game. Look at Michael, you know, needed Steve Kerr, he needed um, uh, John Paxson. So you know, th those guys always uh, need those opportunities to make the right play and have those guys knock it down. Um, the difference between strong and weak side. Well, the strong side is where the ball is, and the weak side is where the the ball is not. So the ball is here. Then this is the strong side. Oh my goodness. And this is the weak side. Okay. Now, God forbid the ball is ever right on the line, right? Then you then you don't know, and it almost never happens. So, but uh, that's kind of why we want you know at least one side, so we, so the offense knows which who's on which side too. Um, let's see here. How do I feel about Isaac Okoro's press on so far? I gotta watch a little bit more. I've been hearing nice things, but I haven't really seen what he's been doing yet. What do you think about the Spurs end of game set plays? Wow, a lot of Spurs fans out here tonight. Um, end of game set plays last season. I mean, generally the Spurs run really good stuff. I could check to see what their rating is in the out of bounds plays, but um, I, I they execute and they really play. They do those well. Like the Brad Stevens, Greg Popovich teams, Steve Kerr's teams. Those, those are all the teams that run uh, those out of bounds plays really, really well. 
Um, when teams do floppies, they should fake run into two screeners, but run to the one screener and the one screener pins down, yes, then open down a three. So what he was saying is sometimes you might get, you know, the double screen here and then a single screen here. Well, the, this guy comes off the single screen and then guess what? The five will come off the four or vice versa. And the five could be open because everyone's thinking that it goes to the two. That's another great way to play that as well. By the way, what you can then do is four can pop up to the pinch post. And one can run, you know, a high po uh, pass it there and then, you know, follow it or do a, a high post split or anything that you want off of that. Another great way to do that. Uh, can you look at the Suns' old players for what they would do for Sotomayor for long twos to the five and that Nets could do for KD to the five? Yeah, the high post. So, uh, you know, Sotomayor and those, and those old Suns teams lived in this area. And uh, Nash lived to get him the ball in that area. Either they'd run him off screens right there, and then he'd roll, or they'd, play, they'd pass it to him and he'd face up, and you'd, it was over. No big man back then could keep in front of Stoudemire one dribble away from the basket. So uh, this is the key, all right in here, the high post area. And that means that the, this area is open for drivers and guys to come in there and then or, and can kick or shoot it. So that's a, a really great that, – that, by the way, KD, this should be KD's area. If you look at a, a heat map of where he runs in the offense in the half court, it should be completely dark in this area right here in my mind. Um, okay. Let's see here. Let's, I think we're going to get close to wrapping this up. This is great stuff. I mean, tell me you know, how you, what you're feeling because uh, you know, we have a nice little group here. Uh, and you know, I guess we have to figure out when I should do this so I don't compete with the games. So I'm thinking about like a Thursday or Friday maybe, but like maybe in the daytime. I don't know. You let, let me let you know in the, in the comments. Um, let's see here. How long do you do the Bulls will rebuild to a deep playoff run or championship? Wow. Um, I don't know. I, I like what they have, but it doesn't scream, you know, title contender to me. So, you know, if I like what they have and they're still young and they can develop and then get there, then, you know, that's three years, four years, three years minimum. Do you think with reference to teams like the Heat that during the regular season they play more one-man defense, but a man-to-man -man defense, but evolve to a zone? Um, I mean, I could see why Spolster wouldn't want to play a lot of zone to kind of tip off whatever, but, you know, everyone knows how a 2-3 zone works, so it's not like you're going to surprise anybody necessarily. Uh, you, can, you can do some fun things with trapping out of that or some interesting rotations that you can save till later, but I just feel like if you're going to run something, you know, a lot in the playoffs, then you need to have reps in the regular season as well, or else you're going to get into trouble with, uh, when you get to the, to the pressure of the playoffs. Um, Let's see here. Should the Clippers try running a triangle offense with Kawhi and PG? Hey, I'm a triangle offense coach. I will always advocate for just about the, uh, you know, as much of the pure triangle as you can. But, you know, the 21 stuff and D'Antoni things and the pistol actions that they run, you know, they're pretty close to the triangle as it is. It's just a little bit less um, uh, organized, I suppose. Uh, and that's, that's the thing you got to worry about because, remember, like in the playoffs, you got to be able to have an offense that can help you generate good shots consistently. Um, who executes high post split, Raptors and Celtics? Uh, the Celtics do a lot of it. The Raptors, um, I don't know. I can't quite picture the Raptors doing it, although I, I imagine they must have done it a lot with Gasol. But without him there, I don't think they're going to do it much. Uh, let's see here. Why does Brad Stevens get nervous when he sees his own defense? I, well, listen, uh, he didn't get nervous per se. They didn't do it very well when they attacked um, uh, against the Heat, although they got better at it. Uh, after, like, what, game four, finally? But it was too late. They were down too much, and then the Heat could simply not play it. You know, and then so that was a nice little adjustment where they're spending a lot of time get working on the zone. And once Spolstra sensed, oh, okay, they kind of figured it out. We're not going to play it anymore. So now all that, all that time they had, they could have been working on other things to develop for the Celtics. They didn't have that anymore. Uh, so it's a, it was a real great, it was an out coaching job by Spolstra basically. Better ceiling, Kuz or THT? Uh, you know, Kuzma in, in my mind is like kind of disappearing out there. I'm a little bit worried about him. Um, I like THT. He might have more skill. Um, but I got to see him in a regular season. I really do. But hey, another super chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Edwin Janice. Thank you. Somewhat unrelated, but with the loss of Ibaka and Gasol, how do you think the Raptors defense will be impacted? I, greatly. Okay. Boucher, you know, needs to make a statement, needs to make a stand and develop once and for all. Um, but, you know, Siakam, again, is still there. He's a great defender. Uh, Lowry is a pest and he can do some things. Uh, OG is a good defender. So they, they'll have, they have good defenders and they can still, you know, keep up a lot of that. But man, um, you know, those two guys really helped. Although I did a breakdown with Ibaka and showed that he's not really the same guy he used to be anyway. Um, so they might not lose that much uh, with him gone. 
But um, obviously, and Gasol, though, was a great anchor, even at his age. And, you know, he played the, what, 20 minutes a game or something. So, uh, but they still have a lot of length and a lot of, um, you know, speed. And they have the zone. So I anticipate them, you know, being pretty effective. Uh, let's see here. Let's wrap this up again. What do you say? A couple more questions. Um, do you think a healthy Bagley could have a breakout? It's so weird. Did you hack my computer, Jonathan? Because I was just talking about Bagley and maybe doing a video on him. I always liked him. He's a, just long, and he can shoot, and he can handle the ball. He's, you can't stop him. He's a lefty. Um, I think Bagley might be – you know what? He might be the breakout star we've all forgotten about. He could come back in, and he might score 20-some a game and be dominant in a, in a place no one's going to watch in Sacramento. Um, keep your eye on that. And in fact, I just told you, but I'm going to do the video and I'm going to look like a real smart person, you know, midway through the season. You watch. Uh, coach looks like a thin Newman. What? Come on now. Uh, whoa, whoa. What? How How did I end up here? Laugh my I haven't even watched people break down in years. I don't know, Julian, but welcome to the conversation. Nick Nurse or Brad Stevens? Wow. I got to go with Nick Nurse. He's got the title and he's got the finals appearance and the uh, finals appearance and the title. Uh, okay, here we go. In game four or five, the Celtics attacked the heat zone badly when Hayward was on the floor, but it was too late. Exactly. Coach, can you explain briefly the actions out of, UC, out of the UCLA high post series, the triangle? Okay, I'll do that and we'll wrap it up with that. Okay, are you ready? He wants to know, uh, there's a, uh, the high post action in the triangle, which is the UCLA, uh, it looks like the UCLA basically, but I'll show you what it is. So the triangle, we went over this last week a little bit, um, basically starts out like something like this. And in, in the high post series, the basic uh, option is, and by the way, you run this the same way every time, all the time, and you kind of get bored with it, and then you can kind of experiment, and you find sort of organic cuts and movement out of that once the five men are on the same page. But basically, okay, one passes a three, and then he does a UCLA cut, which is off the five. This is, the, this is what we call a UCLA cut because uh, John Wooden developed this at UCLA with uh, – Lou Alcindor, who became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and then um, Bill Walton. Bill Walton actually ran it more like this because he was um, on the high post a lot more. Uh, uh, Kareem was on the low post a lot more because they were able to, to uh, adjust it. Now, that said, he ran this way before then with the Walt Hazard teams too. So he makes a UCLA cut, the number the one, to the low block. and then and this is, But this is out of the triangle, which is different than the, than the UCLA offense. Um, the five will then come in and set an inside ball screen for the three. That's basically it. Now, the four can do some, some things. The four can move to the corner. He can you know, flare screen for the two. You can do a lot of fun things like that as well, as long as he stays in this area on that side. Because remember, we got to keep this area open for the three to be able to get in there and get, uh, make a penetration in the five roll. And then the one, by the way, goes to the corner. So now you have a thing where the three can be coming. The three, the three can be attacking in the middle. The five rolls through, and he can then you know find the, the guy, the, the one in the corner, because the one's man here had to help on the roll man. Uh, so that's a great way of playing it. It's very, it's very easy and simple. You could put that in in one day, but um, it's, it's devastating. Especially when you had Michael Jordan getting that ball in the wing, and it's you know, Pippen cutting through, and you know, whatever, however you want to run that, whatever, whatever uh, alignment. It's really a, a great way to get into your attack. So great stuff, guys. Um, you know, I, I think when's the next Me Undies at? I don't know, man. I don't know what happened to Me Undies. I think they loved what I was doing way back then, and they I haven't heard from them in a while. So let's get on that. I'm gonna have to reach out to Me Undies and find out what the heck's up with them and their business model. Um, all right, awesome stuff. Let's go back to my the other shot. Um, I can't, you know, this is amazing. Again, how many people are here and they're interacting with me and you guys are just, you know, uh, it's always a pleasure to go through X's and O's like this. And I hope that you guys love this because uh, it's just a different way of looking at the game. And I love it because you guys can throw out some stuff and I can diagram it. And we can have a good free-flowing conversation, improve everyone's IQ, improve everyone's creativity on the court, and that'll just help everyone understand the game or coach it. Uh, don't forget, I'm going to launch this membership pretty soon. we got some really cool stuff to do, including watch parties related to that and, uh, and more live shows like this and, and just regular general NBA stuff with guests coming on to lend their uh, expertise on what the teams are doing individually. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm getting it all ready for probably next week before the season launches. Um, and I don't know. I think that's, uh, that's all. Uh, I guess um, thank you so much for coming. And don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel. We're a conversation. You in?